Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. Russia's 40-mile military convoy disbands and regroups. Is it preparing for something? And Russia's president says volunteers are welcome to fight against Ukraine. EU leaders are planning to double military support to Ukraine, and sanctions against Russia continue to expand. President Biden sends a message to Democrats ahead of the midterm elections. He says they need to sell their agenda with confidence and clarity and points to lowering unemployment and metrics on the economy to show achievement. But how has the war in Ukraine affected his approval ratings? And the sentencing for former Empire actor Jussie Smollett is announced. We revisit the twists and turns of his unusual case. Russian President Vladimir Putin says some progress has been made in Moscow's talks with Ukraine. However, one military analyst says he thinks Russia may soon try to take the capital city. NTD's Jessica Beatty reports. Russia may be preparing for an attack on Ukraine's capital. Satellite photos taken Thursday appear to show that the military convoy has broken up. One military analyst says a convoy of that size was meant to disband at some point and break into smaller units. So we are in a way seeing um, phase two of this convoy. He says the strategy remains the same, which is to take over Ukraine's capital. But he says it's a difficult city to control because it's flat. The battle for Kiev that is sort of looming large. We've been following this convoy for, for, for days now. Um, the question is more how far Russia is willing to press and go in terms of urban warfare operations and siege warfare uh, to capture Kiev. This is going to be an extremely brutal battle if Russia decides to hold sort of the siege. The analyst says right now the Russia-Ukraine troop ratio is one to one. So unless Russia gets more troops, they'll have a hard time. You can't invade a country on a one-on-one ratio. Nobody has done it. They don't have enough troops to push in, to, um, to dig in inside Ukrainian territory, which means that they need more blood. Literally and proverbially speaking, they need more troops. Meanwhile, Russian leader Vladimir Putin is allowing thousands of volunteers to join Russia's fight against Ukraine. Russia's defense minister said over 16,000 people have applied from countries in the Middle East. So if you see people who want voluntarily, without payment, to come and help people living in Donbas, well, we need to meet their efforts and help them to reach the combat zone. Earlier Friday, Russian airstrikes hit the Ukrainian cities of Dnipro and Lutsk. Ukraine's emergency service says the Russian strikes on Dnipro hit near a preschool and an apartment building. At least one person was killed. And the mayor of Lutsk reported another death when three missiles hit an airfield. Ukraine said it hopes a humanitarian corridor will be open Friday in the southern port city of Mariupol. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Ukrainian emergency services dismantled an unexploded bomb in the northeastern city of Chernihiv. Footage and still pictures were uploaded on social media. They show emergency services personnel pouring a liquid on the device and successfully unscrewing its top to disarm it. The configuration of the buildings seen in the still pictures matches street view and satellite photography of the area. Chernihiv has been the target of heavy Russian shelling. The city's mayor said that some residents managed to evacuate while two-thirds of the city has been left without heat or electricity. On day two of the summit in the Palace of Versailles, European Union leaders are calling for more action against Russia and greater support for Ukraine. This includes an extra $550 million in military aid. The European Commission aims to double the EU's military aid to Ukraine. That's according to EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell, who said a proposal has been made to earmark an extra 500 million euros, or about $550 million. To support Ukraine military with 500 million more, and to continue putting pressure on Russia. This is what we are going to do, and I'm sure that the leaders will approve it this morning. Borrell said the leaders are also looking at stronger sanctions against Russian oligarchs and the Russian economy. Other countries have echoed the European effort. During an interview, Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced the sanctioning of five more Russian oligarchs. They all have ties to Russian leader Vladimir Putin. These individuals will be uh, prevented from dealings in Canada uh, and 
their uh, assets will be frozen. On top of that, we will be placing restrictions on 32 military entities in Russia that will be prevented from receiving uh, any form of Canadian uh, equipment or uh, supplies. And as Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues, the energy crisis in Europe remains a major concern. Germany's foreign affairs minister spoke about alternative energy while attending an event at a wind farm. President Putin's war against Ukraine leaves us in no doubt that we have to reduce our dependency on fossil energy and that we have to expand renewables. In a recent forum, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg stressed the urgency of humanitarian aid to Ukraine. The bare minimum is to establish uh, humanitarian corridors where uh, people can get out and humanitarian aid uh, can get in. Uh, and uh, and uh, any attack on uh, uh, civilians uh, is, uh, is violation of international law, is, is, is a war crime. The first day of the Versailles summit saw division over the scope of sanctions against Moscow. And President Zelensky's call for fast-track entry into the bloc was rejected. But most leaders are confident that Ukraine will eventually secure EU membership. And this just in, President Biden announced the U.S. will dramatically downgrade its trade status with Russia as punishment for its invasion of Ukraine. The U.S. will also ban imports of Russian seafood, alcohol, and diamonds. And we're going to continue to squeeze Putin. The G7 will seek to deny Russia the ability to borrow from leading multinational institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The totality of our sanctions and export controls is crushing the Russian economy. The broad trade shift, which revokes the most favored nation status for Russia, is being taken in coordination with the European Union and Group of Seven Countries. Stripping most favored nation status from Russia would allow the U.S. and its allies to impose higher tariffs on some Russian imports, increasing the isolation of the Russian economy. Biden's changes on Russia's trade status come as bipartisan pressure has been building in Washington to revoke what is formerly known as permanent normal trade relations with Russia. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky pressed the U.S. and allies to take the action against Russia in remarks to Congress over the weekend. It follows days after Biden moved to ban imports of Russian oil and gas products. Refugees fleeing into Moldova from the conflict in Ukraine faced bitter conditions today as temperatures on the region dropped below 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Snowstorms hampered refugees' efforts to reach safety in the country, which shares a long border with Ukraine. Volunteers at the border crossing in southern Moldova handed out blankets, tea, and hot meals to Ukrainian arrivals. Meanwhile, refugees crossing next door into Romania braved to temperatures of 5 degrees Fahrenheit. Officials say as of today, nearly 365,000 Ukrainian refugees have arrived in Romania, as the total number of people fleeing war in Ukraine surpassed 2.5 million. Volunteers are stepping up to help Ukrainian refugees and provide them with basic necessities. Entities Dan Skorback spoke to several people in Poland who are volunteering their time and effort for those in need. Here we are at a Ukrainian-Polish border. The volunteers are helping people to cross and find shelter, find SIM cards, find food. As of March 8, 2 million Ukrainians have left their country to flee the war. Some people have relatives abroad, some have nowhere to go. But everyone we talk to wants to go back as soon as possible to Ukraine. At this border crossing in Medica, Poland, mostly women and children make their way through a corridor of volunteers. A lot of volunteers are coming from different countries, people from Czech Republic, Sweden, England, Italy and India. After picking up necessities, the refugees queue for the buses. The buses come straight here to the border and volunteers, police and military help people to carry their bags from the border to the buses or the train. Then people take their trip into Poland or find further places where they can stay. I spoke to an American named Nathan Schweitkart. He came to Ukraine to rescue his fiancé. There's dozens of buses at the Lviv uh, railway station right now. So um, it's packed full of people, but they're shuttling people back and forth right now. More, more so, of course, coming back over to this side. I'm glad to get her to safety and all is well. I spoke to Para, who so cooks and do. distributes you know, 2,000 cups of soup each day. We're just sharing some food. 
because what actually everybody is missing is some love and food is like love and so and actually my volunteers are amateurs coming from the French word amour which they all do it out of love and that's what people need in this world a little love and I've heard from Kieran British ex-military who has dozens of stamps in his passport because he pushes carts of groceries across the border since it's complicated to cross in a car. And so now what we do is I come across, sort the teams out this end and we take supplies and then we fill the cars. Once the cars are full, we can then sleep <laughs> and then we do the same again the next day. So, so you bring, you we go bring to the supermarket now supermarket and we buy, buy all okay. chocolates, everything, anything that's... Um, these people have got money, they don't need, you can see, they don't need clothes, they don't need shoes. Mm -hmm. They need chocolate bars to sustain themselves for the journey yeah? Yeah. And from Lviv to here. So that's what we're doing. Yeah? I also met a Ukrainian who started a volunteer organization that has been providing food, hygiene products and even medicine to the refugees. There are kids who have genetic diseases in Chernihiv. The conditions are such that they can't be without their medicine and now all supply chain for medication has stopped. Without these medications the kids have a few days to live because we're able to find here our guys who are willing to risk their lives to go there to help, risking their lives to go to those bunkers, basements and find those families, bring the medicine to them. Although everybody is tired, there are smiles on people's faces. The free coffee, the free food, the phone plans, the accommodations, they do help. This is Dan Skorbak, Polish-Ukrainian border, NTD News. Approximately 100 U.S. citizens have been cleared to join Ukrainian forces fighting against Russia. They're part of a wave of some 20,000 foreigners who have been approved to fight. The Americans include veterans who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. Top U.S. officials have discouraged Americans from going to fight in Ukraine. The embassy in Washington, D.C. has heard from at least 6,000 people wanting to go since the war started. Many potential recruits are rejected. Ukraine's military attaché says some apply without the needed military experience and some have criminal backgrounds. Some are too old or too young. Some who expressed interest were rejected because the embassy said it couldn't do adequate vetting. Those approved must make their own way to Poland before crossing into Ukraine. Worldwide solidarity for Ukrainians has shown itself in many ways, from thousands of protests against Russian aggression in over 90 countries, to the EU showing strong support for Ukrainians fleeing their country, and even to Idaho dubbing Thursday as Solidarity for Ukraine Day. But what about the spirit of Ukrainians inside their borders? Professor of Sociology Cynthia Buckley at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign weighs in on the issue. Well, I think a couple of things that really are important to keep in mind is that at this point in time, the rally around the flag effect, the idea of coming together and the idea of social unity in Ukraine has really never been stronger. And this is the exact opposite of what Putin predicted. He was predicting chaos and that people would scatter. This is not occurring. Um, I think, secondly, part of it is you've seen the emergence of an enormously charismatic leader in Zelensky. Zelensky, him staying and working with the troops and being in Kiev, Kiev for now has been tremendous in terms of solidifying unity, establishing an a idea of um, patriotism, and really bringing Ukrainians together. But third, and clearly, we are at a precipice right now in terms of um, social services in particularly central and eastern Ukraine. And that, as that develops, may sort may start to diminish the idea of social solidarity and patriotism as we see more big cities go without water, without health care, without basic social services. On and the on other note, hand... Professor, I did want to ask you, I mean, 1,207 civilians have been collected off the streets of Mariupol. People there don't have access to food. They don't have access to water. Children are even dying of dehydration. What are the prospects of a ceasefire agreement happening anytime soon? I don't see on the Russian side any sort of motivation for a ceasefire anytime soon. Lavrov's behavior in face of clear hum um, war crimes has been um, quite surprising, even for Sergei Lavrov. And so a ceasefire, unfortunately, is not on the table at present. What do you think is going to happen in the aftermath of this war in terms of war crimes? 
Um, we will have to wait and see. I think if the um, aftermath of the war is that Russia assumes um, control of Ukraine, it will be very difficult for the West and for the international community to bring them to justice. On the other hand, if there is perhaps a change in governmental structure in Russia, we may find that some individuals will be held culpable. The United States is conducting a legal review to determine if Russia has committed war crimes in its invasion of Ukraine. The White House says if Moscow intentionally targeted civilians, that would count as a war crime, but an assessment is needed to make a final conclusion. The U.S. Senate approved a $1.5 trillion spending package Thursday. The funding will keep the government running through September 30th and allocate $13.6 billion in military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine. President Biden is now expected to sign the bill into law, averting a shutdown when current government funds run out at midnight on Friday. Aid for Ukraine has been one of the few issues receiving bipartisan support in Congress. Meanwhile, the fate of a House-approved bill calling for a ban on Russian oil remains unclear. That bill also reviews Moscow's participation in international trade programs. The National Association for Gun Rights is criticizing Democrats' $1.5 trillion spending package. The group says it includes items that are a serious expansion of federal gun control. Currently, almost all firearm sales require a background check. It determines if they can make the purchase. But measures included in the spending package can make anyone attempting to buy a firearm while legally barred subject to criminal investigation. The National Association for Gun Rights warns that over 95 percent of background check denials are false positives. The stated reason for this provision is to protect women from domestic abusers, but the gun rights group says the system could deny women the right to get a firearm and put them under criminal investigation. Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein admitted the bill is not perfect, but insisted that it would strengthen existing programs against domestic violence. Ahead of critical midterms this year, President Biden sends a message to Democrats. He spoke to the Democratic National Committee on Thursday night, the eve of the anniversary of his signing the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan. During his remarks, he advised Democrats on how they should convey their agenda to the American people. Now what we have to do is we have to sell it with confidence, clarity, conviction, and repetition. The midterms are important for Biden because they'll help shape the second half of his term as president. But are Democrats pushing their economic plans enough to get voters fired up? Business Insider reports some Democrats worry that's not the case. But Biden pushes on anyway by highlighting recent job growth. We're now well over 7 million new jobs. 678,000 jobs last month. (laughs) Unemployment down to 3.8 percent. Republicans have criticized Biden for holding back domestic oil production amid a ban on Russian oil. That ban is pushing gas prices even higher. Here, Biden makes a promise on oil production and says the battle for freedom worldwide isn't free. But we need to be honest with the American people. The battle for freedom has its cost here at home as well. People are already, already feeling Putin's price hikes at the pump. I think the American people know how important this fight is. I think they know that as painful as the price is today, the costs are going to be higher if we do not act now to deal with this tyrant. In terms of momentum, Biden and Democrats faced two recent letdowns. For one, the president's Build Back Better social spending bill failed to pass Congress. The other is that Democrats' efforts to change voting procedures petered out. But following his State of the Union address and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Biden's approval rating has gone up a bit. A federal court ruled that Illinois violated the National Voter Registration Act when it refused to provide an election integrity group with access to the state's voter roll. The plaintiff said election officials must allow citizens to see what they are doing. The plaintiff is from the Public Interest Legal Foundation. The group uses records and data to determine the integrity of elections. 
It analyzes voter rolls to do this. The defendants are the executive director of the Illinois State Board of Elections, the board itself, and two other board officials. A judge ordered the elections board to implement policies and procedures to make the statewide voter registration list available to the public. Sensitive information would remain private. The judge also ordered defendants to pay the plaintiffs court fees. The plaintiff is a former civil rights attorney at the Justice Department. He says the group's says his group's efforts have found dead and duplicate registrants and voters registered in multiple states. He says accurate voter rolls are essential to free and fair elections. Former Empire actor Jesse Smollett was sentenced to 150 days in jail Thursday. That's after he was convicted on five felony counts of disorderly conduct. Smollett's convictions stem from a January 2019 incident in which he was accused of lying to police about being the victim of a possible hate crime. And today's Dave Martin has more. After speaking for more than 30 minutes, Cook County Judge James Lynn announced Smollett would be sentenced to 30 months probation, would pay restitution of just over $120,000 and pay a $25,000 fine before getting to the matter of jail time. And you will spend the first 150 days of your sentence in the Cook County Jail. Smollett, who declined to make a statement before the judge announced his sentencing, was then asked if he had any questions. I am not suicidal. I am innocent, and I am not suicidal. If I did this, then it means that I stuck my fist in the fears of black Americans in this country for over 400 years and the fears of the LGBTQ community. Your Honor, I respect you, and I respect the jury, but I did not do this and I am not suicidal, and if anything happens to me when I go in there, I did not do it to myself, and you must all know that. Smollett then continued proclaiming his innocence as he was escorted from the courtroom. I am not suicidal. Stop laughing about black people. I am not suicidal, and I am innocent. I could have said that I was guilty a long time ago. Each of Smollett's five charges carried a maximum sentence of three years in jail. The sentence caps a bizarre chain of events. Smollett had originally been charged in February 2019 with a 16-count indictment for filing a false police report about being the victim of an alleged homophobic and racist attack. The charges were abruptly dropped, though, less than a month later in a decision that was criticized by police and city officials. A special prosecutor was then assigned to the case and came back with six charges against him. Smollett pled not guilty, but a jury found him guilty on five of the charges back on December 9. Dave Martin, NTD News. Major League Baseball and its locked-out players reach an agreement on a five-year labor deal that ends the second-longest work stoppage in the game's history. I have to say I am genuinely thrilled to be able to say that Major League Baseball's back and we're going to play 162 games. Um... I do want to start by apologizing to our fans. I know that the last few months have been difficult. There was a lot of uncertainty um, at a point in time when there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. Team owners voted to ratify the agreement hours after players approved the new labor pact. It includes increased minimum salaries, a new pre-arbitration bonus pool to reward top young players, and a raise in competitive, balanced tax thresholds. The MLB locked out players last December and announced the first two weeks of the 2022 season were canceled as they inched towards an agreement. The head of the players' union says negotiations achieved benefits for current and future players. Spring training camps will open on Sunday, and the regular season will start April 7th. Doubleheaders have been added to the schedule to make up for games canceled. The season was originally set to start on March 31st. The Transportation Security Administration will enforce mask mandates for another month. That's until federal authorities decide on new mask rules. I don't like the COVID. It's dangerous, but I'm tired of the masks. And if everybody's inoculated, I really don't see the necessity anymore. As long as people are still contracting COVID, I think it's still needed. So I, I, I agree with it. The TSA enforces rules that extend to planes, buses, trains, and transit hubs. The mask mandate for travel was scheduled to expire March 18th. 
but the TSA is now extending it through April 18th. The agency says the extra month will give the CDC time to develop new policies. As of March 3rd, more than 90% of the U.S. population lives in areas with low or medium COVID-19 case levels, so the CDC is no longer recommending face masks in public indoor settings. That led critics to question why the CDC would allow maskless people to gather in movie theaters and sports arenas, but not on planes. A significant winter storm is expected to impact a large portion of the eastern U.S. over the weekend. The storm may bring a variety of weather threats to the area, including heavy snowfall and severe thunderstorms. The National Weather Service says the storm will begin on Friday and continue through Saturday night. It's expected to produce weather threats over parts of the Ohio, Tennessee valleys and the interior eastern U.S., going as far south as Georgia. And AccuWeather meteorologists say millions of Americans will face some type of impact from the massive storm system. It is expected to strengthen into a bomb cyclone along the East Coast, bringing strong winds and frigid temperatures. Winter storm warnings have already been issued for residents in a number of states, including Alabama, Ohio, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Oklahoma. The average cost of gas in the U.S. is over $4.30 a gallon, and sticker shock at the pump has many Americans planning to make some changes. A AAA survey reveals that 60% of Americans say they will change their driving and lifestyle habits. 80% of all drivers surveyed said they would drive less to save on fuel. A third of adult drivers under the age of 35 said they would be open to carpooling. 68% of drivers over the age of 35 said they would rather save by combining errands. And 53% of older Americans said they would cut back on shopping or dining out to save money on gas. Coming up, family members of opioid victims confront the Sackler family in a court hearing. They blame the family's Purdue Pharma and its painkiller OxyContin for helping fuel the opioid crisis. And a professional pianist turned baker wows patrons with her cakes. Her buttercream creations are lifelike to the eye and as delicate as works of art. All that and more here on MTV News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Larry Elder here, and I've got some great news for you. If you're tired of the censorship in this country, then you're in luck. You can go over to epictv.com and watch honest programs that don't spin the facts. EpicTV.com is a brand new, no censorship video platform where you can watch not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great program, wholesome movies that you can watch with your entire family. So head over to EpicTV.com. I'll see you there. Victor deployed for the first time to Afghanistan in 2003. He sustained a moderate traumatic brain injury. Basically, he had to relearn everything. One of the most important elements of caregiving is taking care of yourself. We have our own journey, and we can fulfill that journey at the same time that we are helping our loved one. Visit aarp.org caregiving for a free military veteran's guide to navigate your caregiving journey. A close call for a deputy in Montana this week. Watch the left side of your screen. You can see a Gallatin County deputy speaking to people inside a car in a median on Interstate 90. 
Then a truck appears to lose control and goes into the median, hitting the car. The deputy managed to get out of the way, and no one was hurt in the incident. The Gallatin County Sheriff's Office says the video should serve as a reminder to drivers to slow down and move over for officers. 220 law enforcement officers died in similar incidents between 2007 and 2021. Members of the Sackler family appeared in a court hearing over their company, Purdue Pharma. Opioid victims and their loved ones took the opportunity to confront the Sacklers for the opioid epidemic. Here are the details. During a virtual hearing in the U.S. bankruptcy court on Thursday, family members of opioid victims blamed the Sackler family and their company, Purdue Pharma, for helping fuel the opioid crisis. It has to do with Purdue's signature painkiller, OxyContin, and how it was marketed by the company. How did it feel for them to know that they ripped lives apart? Other things I asked them was, how can you blame the victims? How can you possibly blame the victims for something you created, manufactured, and marketed? Three Sackler family members attended the virtual hearing, They were Richard, Teresa, and David Sackler. Richard Sackler appeared only via audio. He is the former Purdue president and board chair. It was incredibly difficult because as I was reading um, and and talking to Dr. Richard Sackler, um, I was having images of friends of mine who I've lost, you know, to overdoses in the last um, three years. Under court rules, the Sackler family members could not respond and had to sit silently while roughly two dozen people gave emotional statements. To me, it was great to be part of this testimonial with so many people going through this. Um, So that was, to me, it was almost like being part of this court record is very important and my son's story being part of the record. Richard Sackler has said that the company and family bear no responsibility for the opioid crisis. A California man was pistol whipped in an attempted robbery by follow home bandits. The assault occurred just after he parked his Lamborghini outside of his Los Angeles apartment building. Video of the violent assault was released by robbery homicide division detectives in an effort to get the public's help in identifying the suspects. A police statement said the victim and a friend went to an upscale restaurant in the Hollywood area on March 6th. The victim gave his friend a ride home and then drove to his apartment building. On the way, he noticed that a white sedan was following him. The victim turned into an alley and parked in front of the rear entrance of the building. He observed that the sedan also turned into the alley. The white sedan and another car stopped in the middle of the alley as the victim walked toward the doorway. Two assailants got out of the vehicles while others remained in the cars. Police say that one robber pointed a handgun at the victim and demanded his watch. A struggle ensued and the victim was pistol whipped before the assailants ran to their cars and fled. A famous pianist in New York channeled her artistic flair for music into baking. During the pandemic, she made lifelike buttercream bouquets that rivaled works of art. Let's take a look. New York pianist Nava Perlman Frost began playing piano at the age of six. After 35 years of professional performances, she is moving on to a new career, baking cakes and decorating them with lifelike buttercream flowers. The idea for this was sort of born out of my longtime interest in making the cakes look good. It's been a while um, since not just baking, but decorating um, was something I was interested in. The 51-year-old is the daughter of renowned violinist Itzhak Perlman. Her piano career has taken her across the United States and onto the stages of Carnegie Hall and Lincoln Center. I was an art history major in college. Um, I've always loved beautiful things to look at. The pandemic two years ago put her concerts on hold. She then began watching YouTube tutorials and started making cakes. She says she couldn't find a better way to pass the time. I didn't think I was going to actually end up selling anything. At the urging of friends and family, she posted photos of her sweet treats on Instagram. 
Her frosted flowers look like fresh bouquets of roses, peonies, and tulips. Or they mimic works of art, like Vincent van Gogh's irises. In December 2020, she founded a company that bears her name. Some of her cakes are gluten and dairy free. Prices range from about $80 to $200. People have said to me in the beginning, they were like, you're undercharging. I'm like, it's cake. <laughs> she says she enjoys the feeling of creating. Art is, is something that, whether it's through your ears or your eyes or your emotions, brings you to a different place and makes you sort of for a moment, even if it's a really small moment, go, oh, and sort of just jogs you. As life gradually returns to normal after the pandemic, Frost may not return to the stage, but she has found a magical connection between baking and music. I find that this is almost expressive in a similar way as, as music is. It's sort of something personal that is just coming from you. Um, and it's, it, feels, it feels similar. I don't... She will continue to amaze her patrons with her art of baking. As she says, people cherish special moments, even the smallest ones. Still to come, a Ukrainian couple fears another nuclear disaster. They were evacuated from their home near Chernobyl during its nuclear disaster in 1986. Some people are taking their anger out at a Russian restaurant in New York. This despite their owners expressing support for Ukraine. Find out more after the short break. In the Black Sea port city of Odessa, walls of sandbags surround the monument of Duke de Richelieu, the early 19th century governor who helped transform the Black Sea port into a modern city. The famous monument was erected in 1828 and is a popular site for tourists. After Russian forces began attacking Ukrainian cities such as Mariupol, museums and local authorities rushed to protect their heritage, stowing away precious artworks, religious icons, and fortifying national monuments. Odessa's famous 19th century Italian Baroque Opera House, which survived World War II, is also surrounded on all sides by sandbag barriers while a military vehicle is parked across its entrance. Soldiers are on guard around the historical landmark and on the rest of the streets and in the port city. The city fears an imminent attack, possibly by sea. Its Black Sea port is a crucial commercial and transport hub for the country. Just one day ago, Ukraine lost all communication with the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The plant lost all external power supply on the same day and emergency generators were put to use. Here's the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations nuclear watchdog. I must say that communications with Chernobyl uh, have been a bit shaky. There have been interruptions and restorations depending on different times uh, of the day. Prior to the loss of communications, the site's power lines were damaged and disconnected from the grid. If the site is to receive continuous power, either the power lines must be repaired or diesel fuel must be delivered. But fortunately, the operator confirmed even in the event of a complete power outage, there would be no impact on the basic safety systems of the spent fuel storage facility. And the fuel for the generators would last for two days. The cause of the power outage remains unclear. Both Ukraine and Russia have said they will cooperate to solve this problem. A Ukrainian couple in their 60s was evacuated from their home near the Chernobyl plant in 1986. They worked at the plant as engineers when a reactor exploded, triggering, triggering the world's worst nuclear accident. Now, they say they fear a huge catastrophe could happen again. Valerie and his wife Halina used to work as engineer chemists at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. In 1986, they had to evacuate their home in Pripyat when a reactor exploded, triggering the world's worst nuclear accident. Now they fear they may once again lose their home, the Chernihiv, as Russian troops shell towns and bridges in the area. God forbid if we had to be evacuated again. Losing their home is not their only concern. The couple fear Ukraine could see another nuclear catastrophe. 
Zaporizhia, Europe's largest nuclear power plant, has been in Russian hands since last week when a blaze broke out in a building at the site after clashes between Russian and Ukrainian forces. The United Nations nuclear watchdog said on it Wednesday had lost touch with its remote systems that monitor nuclear material at the facility. The now defunct Chernobyl power plant is also in the hands of the Russians. Valery says the nuclear units at both plants are well protected, but warns there could still be a huge catastrophe if a rocket hits. If it gets there, the shelter object could be destroyed, and then the radiation would spread all over Europe. If any of the reactors at Energoda, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, is damaged, it will be Fukushima. The couple spend their days hiding in their basement. Bridges and roads surrounding their town have been destroyed or occupied by the Russians, they say, so they are cut off from the rest of the country and the outside world. Khalina bakes bread, which Valerie delivers to their neighbours. She says it keeps her calm. For Valerie, the belief that Ukraine will be victorious keeps him going. A Los Angeles hospital donated a huge load of medical supplies to aid Ukrainians. The 200 boxes of supplies packed into 10 pallets were being sent from the Northridge Hospital Medical Center to Project Cure, a global distributor of medical supplies eventually bound for Ukraine. The shipment included surgical gowns and drapes, instruments, wound care supplies, tourniquets, masks, gloves, gauze, needles, syringes, antiseptics, and disinfection solutions for wounds. Paul H. Watkins, the president of Northridge Hospital Medical Center, said they've taken these from their own emergency supply, some of which were actually overstocked due to COVID. He adds it's really good to do something positive for others. The shipment was estimated by organizers to be worth $10,000. The co-owner of the Russian Samovar restaurant in Manhattan has a blue and yellow Ukrainian flag on the front door of her venue. She put the flag there on the day Russia invaded Ukraine. Vlada von Schatz is the co-owner of the Russian Samovar, a restaurant in Manhattan's theater district serving a blini, chicken Kiev, and flights of infused vodkas. But she has found that a war an ocean away is now threatening her business. Some people, outraged over the Russian invasion of Ukraine, are taking their anger out on her Russian restaurant. But the family behind the business straddles both sides in the conflict and opposes the fighting. My husband is Ukrainian. My children are half Ukrainian, half Russian. How do you explain that? Two brother nations at war. And we have family in Russia. I have relatives in St. Petersburg. My husband has relatives in Odessa, which is now preparing to be invaded. Russia is a terror state! Anti-Russian sentiment in the U.S. has meant that this eatery, established in 1986 by people who fled the Soviet Union, is now tarred by association. From day one of the war, we have put the sign up, we stand with Ukraine, no war, and we have a Ukrainian flag on our door. Well, that didn't, apparently that didn't send the message clear enough to the people that are still blaming us for the, for the war. Now we, we're called fascists and Nazis on the phone. Um, we have hate emails. We, our sign was kicked in. The reservations, the worst part, uh, business dropped about 60%. The restaurant was already struggling following closures and gathering restrictions. Von Schatz says she and her business are against the invasion and support Ukrainian independence. And she said that as patrons learned the restaurant was being targeted, many decided to show their support. I'm getting good emails. My Facebook is flooded with support e messages and we feel the love, but still the business is down and still we worry about our people that are stuck in Ukraine and still we worry and we have to nurture through our staff that was Ukrainian. We're doing everything possible, everything in our power to help. India says it accidentally fired a missile at Pakistan this week. In a statement, the country explains the cause as a technical glitch during routine maintenance. Pakistan warned that the incident could lead to unpleasant consequences. The country's foreign ministry said it had summoned the Indian diplomat in Islamabad 
protesting what it called an unwarranted violation of its airspace. It also called for an investigation into the incident, accusing the firing of endangering passenger flights and civilian lives. The Indian government promised to take a serious view and ordered a high-level inquiry into the case. Pakistan has required India to share its findings. According to military experts, there is indeed a risk of accidents or miscalculations between the two countries. The long-standing rival neighbors have fought three wars so far. The most recent was an Air Force engagement in 2019, and both countries have nuclear weapons. Up next, we take a look at the upcoming thriller movie, All the Old Knives, which premieres in Hollywood. It will tell the story of two spies and a failed mission involving a hijacking. And a new Netflix movie tells the improbable story of a shelter dog who was nearly euthanized only to become a police canine. The courageous pup went on to rescue a teenage boy. Stay tuned to find out more. An unthinkable genocide took the lives of six million Jews and thousands of Jewish survivors are still suffering in poverty today. God calls on people who believe in him to act on his word. Comfort ye, comfort my people. Especially during this holiday season of Passover. When I come here and I sit with Lily, I realize what she needs right now is food. These elderly Jews are weak and they're sick. They're living on $2 a day. This now is how God's children are living. Take this time to send a survival food box to these forgotten Jews. The International Fellowship of Christians and Jews urgently need your gift of $25 now to help provide one survival food box with all of the essentials they critically need for their diet for one month. Your special holiday gift will provide everything they need to celebrate the holy season of Passover. Do you remember matzah? This is the first time in over 70 years that she has anything to do with faith. She hasn't seen unleavened bread since before the Holocaust. And now we're coming to her and we're saying, it's okay to have faith. For just $25, you can help supply the essential foods they desperately need for one month. For over 35 years, this trusted ministry has given Christians like me a way to tangibly bless Jewish people who are in need throughout the world. God tells us to take care of them, to feed the hungry. And I pray Holocaust survivors will be given the basic needs that they so desperately pray for to survive. Upcoming thriller movie, All the Old Knives, gets a Hollywood premiere. The movie is based on the novel by Olin Steinhauer, and it will tell the story of two spies. Let's take a look. Celia. It's been a long time. They've opened the books on Flight 127. The hijackers had help from inside our station here in Vienna. We need to find out. The movie All the Old Knives stars Hollywood actors Chris Pine and Tandwee Newton. Vic has me looking into Flight 127. So this they hit the red carpet on Wednesday. The story is set during a meal between two ex-lovers who are also CIA operatives. It's a really bittersweet story. It's a heartbreaking um, There's a bit of Romeo and Juliet and then a bit of Casablanca and um, uh, he, I think Olin writes with the same kind of flair as a Le Carre or uh, uh, any other masters of the, of the genre. Um, um, but I think what we capture hopefully is that poetic nature of, of his writing. The hijacking no, appears to have taken the most yeah, tragic development. Someone in our station betrayed us. What about you? In the movie, the two main characters discuss a failed mission in the past that involved a disastrous hijacking. One of the two characters won't survive the meal. The movie relies heavily on the chemistry between Newton and Pine. So how did they bond? Dancing. Dancing, actually. I love dance. I thought Chris and I should actually learn some kind of dance skill together as a way of 
kind of befriending each other, but we couldn't because of COVID. And then it turned out that he was already learning to ballet. And I come from ballet and, and contemporary dance. It's the things that we don't know that get to me. The film is directed by Danish director Janus Metz. It will stream on Amazon from April 8th. What we had was real, wasn't it? A new Netflix movie tells the improbable story of a shelter dog who was nearly euthanized only to become a police canine. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. Canine unit. Best Rescued best. by Ruby tells the story of a special canine, an almost uncontrollable Australian Shepherd and Border Collie mix with a very unique life story. She could be anything. So Ruby's story is quite amazing. Um, she was a shelter dog uh, over in East Providence, Rhode Island for the first eight months of her life. For the first eight months of her life, she kept getting returned to the shelter because she was deemed unadoptable. That did not deter shelter volunteer and dog trainer Patricia Inman. She continued to try to find Ruby a home amid growing fears that she might get euthanized. Rhode Island State Police Trooper Corporal Daniel O'Neill eventually took a chance on her. I'm just this guy that just loves what I, I do and, and I want to try to make a difference in the world and I have a dog that wants to do the same and it's truly amazing that now it's being memorialized in this movie that people will be able to see forever. O'Neill invested time and energy in training Ruby into a police dog. Six years later, Ruby located a teenage boy. He'd been severely injured while hiking in dense woods. So after six hours uh, of searching with Ruby, the Ruby ended up going off by herself and searching an area. And when I went to chase after her, I came around the corner and all of a sudden there was a young boy uh, laying on the ground face down. Ruby was sitting there licking his face, trying to, almost like trying to revive him. The boy turned out to be Inman's son. When O'Neill knocked on the door of the boy's home to deliver the good news, he found himself face to face with Inman. So I was just beside myself and then a few minutes later, Dan and, and um, the state police people came and said, you know, did you know, it was Ruby who found your son and I was just, you know, it was just like, I, it was just, yeah, mind blowing. I, you know, it took a while for that to sink in. Meanwhile, there's still the occasional misadventure, but Ruby continues to serve as an invaluable partner. Speak. Rescued by Ruby premieres March 17th. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. She's a handful. She's too high strung. She chews, she digs, she steals food, she never sleeps. She's not even housebroken. Check this out. Scientists have discovered a new colorful species of fish hiding in the coral reefs of the Maldives. The new species belongs to the wrasse family, which consists of bright colored fish. Its scientific name honors the pink rose, the Maldivian national flower. Scientists say the colorful species can be found living anywhere from 130 to 230 feet below the ocean's surface. Shen Yun performed to a packed theater in the heart of New York City last night. Federal, state, and city officials welcomed back the performers with letters and proclamations. It, it, it's a universal inspiration. Simply, simply amazed. I, the stories, the storyline, the message, um, how it really hits you to, to change. The classical Chinese dance performance has been touring all over the country and captivating audiences from all walks of life. Enlightening. All of my senses were tingling. I, I love the fact that it's bringing back some of the old cultures, some of the old beliefs from free China which is very different than the way it is now. From legend to folk dance, New York-based Chenyun Performing Arts brings China's 5,000 years of culture back to the stage through art. My son was jumping up and down, really enjoying the dances, but also I think he learned a lot during the dances, which is, a, which is one of the most important things. I love the fact that every time I watch it, I always take something away from it, and I cannot explain it to people unless you bring a guest with you, what you actually feel. And the artists are just so passionate and so talented. According to Shen Yun's website, the artists follow an ancient Chinese tradition and believe that they have to cultivate themselves inwardly in order to present something truly good and beautiful on stage.
I'm a ballerina myself, so I really appreciated all the flexibility and the grace and how they dance, the costumes, it was excellent. The movements are so intricate, the performers are so expressive. Um, it's amazing the control that they have over their bodies. Some audience members say the performance has had a positive impact on their lives. Being in heaven, nature, something which is calming me. I definitely felt joy during the whole time and, and leaving as well. I feel very positive. I, I think the pandemic has cost us a bit of our humanity and I hope coming out and coming to shows like this will allow us to redevelop our humanity. Shen Yun will continue to perform at Lincoln Center in the heart of New York City until March 20th. Entity News, New York. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.